All right, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Wa Salatu Wa Salam, Ala Sayyid Al Mursaleen Muhammadin Al Amin Amma Bad. So today I want to uh, share with you uh, this lesson because I think it's important for those of us uh, that are trying to study the deen. And, uh, and so there are two important points that I want to deal with, and inshallah, it will not take a lot of time. But at the same time, there are uh, significant uh, points, as you will see. Okay, people are still coming in. So let me get started, inshallah. Let me start with two narrations. So this is the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu when it comes to Ya'juj and Ma'juj that has, you can say, confused the people. And this is why I want to talk about this hadith and another hadith. And these two ahadith, they contradict each other. So then we have to deal with this. And so this is the first uh, lesson and the first principle will be derived from this particular discussion. So this hadith, by the way, the one that we're about to study first, the one that has caused a lot of, uh, a lot of confusion in the people. This is the hadith in Ibn Majah. It's also in Tirmazi. Okay, I believe the similar words are in Tirmazi, but we're studying the one in Ibn Majah. And over here, I want to mention a rule. Okay. When muhaddisin write a book, they give it chapters and they give it a name. The hadith that comes under the chapter is the hadith, right? But when somebody writes the title of the chapter, then it is believed that that is the, you can say the belief or the belief system of the one who is writing the book. So quoting the hadith is different from writing the chapter of the book. The chapter of the book tells us more about what the author is thinking, whereas the hadith, somebody can look at the same hadith and come to a different conclusion. Okay. So this bab, this chapter, is called Fitna of Dijjal, the Fitna of Dijjal, wa kharuj al Isa ibn Maryam, and the coming out of Isa ibn Maryam, and kharuj Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and the coming out of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Okay. Now this hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, which is going to be an important point as we discuss this hadith. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna ya'juja wa ma'juja yahrifuna kulla yawmin, indeed ya'juja and ma'juj, they dig kulla yawmin every day, hatta until. So every day they come close to a point. Yakadu, as if it's like almost Yarauna Shua Ashams, as if they are seeing the sun rays of the sun. So those that are with them, they say, go back. So nahrifuhu ghadan. We'll continue digging tomorrow. Fayyuduhu Allah ashadda makana. Then Allah returns the wall back to an estate stronger than when they left it. Hat kan hatta ida balaga until there reaches muddatahum until a long time, some time reaches. وَأَرَادَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَبْعَثَهُمْ عَلَى النَّاسِ And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to send them, ba'atha is also used in the sense of sending an army. This is also in the famous hadith of Mahdi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that an army will come and it will be sunk in the ground. And Aisha says, the, even the good people in the prophecy, yeah, if the evil is more than the word used there is ba'atha. So ba'atha is used for armies. 
specifically. Where else is this word used as for the army? Ba'atha, the one we see here in Surah Al-Bani Israel in the very beginning. Just because I want this to be understood clearly, let me actually share with you the uh, tradition of the Prophet as well as the eye of the Quran I'm referring to very quickly. Okay. People are still coming in, so have to attend to that too. Hold on one second. So we are in Sutul Isra now. And now let me show you. Ba'athna alayhim, and we sent against them. Ibadan lana, our servants, uli ba'asin shadid, that had great military power. Okay, so ba'atha is sent, used in that sense. And also, let me try to find the hadith quickly, where uh, um, So over here, Ba'uth an Ghazwa had al bayt hatta yaqsifu bil jahsh minhum. So there will be an army sent against the Mahdi that will then be sunk by the earth. Okay. So this is the hadith that's referring to that. Now let's go back to the original hadith. Uh, so then Allah, uh, so. The hadith says, When a certain time period passes, Then Allah decides to send them against a people. And they will dig it until they see the rays of the sun. So this time they succeed. Okay. Uh, sorry, this time they, they, they go, قَالَ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِمْ اِرْجِعُوا فَسَتَحْرِفُونَهُ غَدًا We will dig tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala. But this time they use the word, inshaAllah. وَاسْتَثْنِسُوا And they said, inshaAllah, same word is used. فَيَعُودُونَ إِلَيْهِ وَهُوَ كَيْحَتِّهِ هِنَا تَرَكَهُ So this time it's in the same shape. كَحَيْئَةٍ This is also used in the Quran. When Isa alayhi would give the mud the shape of a bird and blow into it, that's kaihatin. Okay. Same. Uh, same word. Allahumma salli ala maha. Wa huwa kaihatihi hina tarakuhu. And it will be in the same shape that he uh, left it in. So this time the hole doesn't cover itself. And they come upon the people. And the hadith continues from there that I'm not going to touch on that this time, the right now. Okay. Only this part where, where the hadith is mentioning what the hadith is mentioning, they dig on the wall, and every day the wall returns back to the former state until Allah sends after some time an army of them and they will say inshallah and when they say inshallah then the army will be allowed to pass through the wall. Now this hadith is in Ibn Majah and Tirmazi and now let me show you the hadith of the Prophet that is contradicting this narration of the Prophet Okay, so that we can kind of understand what is going on here. And uh, the, this is what shaitan sometimes does. Uh, shaitan cannot attack Quran. So what he does is he causes, uh, you can say confusion, especially in Hadith literature. Okay? And I can give you uh, many examples of that. Uh, for example, uh, he made uh, Muslims try to forget the word Qustantunia and made the city of Qustantunia into Istanbul and Istanbul into Istanbul. Okay, so it's like out of out of out of uh, you know out of sight, out of mind, right? Uh, 
And so many times this has happened. So now let me share with you another narration of the Prophet Sallallahu This narration is in Bukhari and it's in Muslim. It's muttafaqun alayh. Yani it's the highest degree of a hadith. Okay? Highest degree of a hadith. What does that say? Well, that narration says this. Something that differentiates between this particular narration and that narration, th this narration and this other narration, as I will show you, inshallah, in just a little bit. Okay? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, An Ummi Habiba binti Abi Sufyan, An Zainab, okay, Anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dakhla alayha yawman fafazi'a. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered his house, okay, and he was fazi'a. He was scared. He was surprised. He was not, he was kind of like shocked, okay. And you know, when you're in a state of shock, how you'll say like, la ilaha illallah, astaghfirullah, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la ilaha illallah, waylul lil Arab. Destruction is for the Arabs. Now, the Prophet didn't say Muslims. I'm going to come to this point in a little bit. Waylul lil Arab min sharrin qad iqtarab. Lil Arab. Woe upon the Arabs because of the evil that has come near them. Futihat al yawm the Prophet said, today there has been an opening. Min radam, ya'juj wa ma'juj, mithli hadha. From the dam, radam is used for a dam. So from the radam of ya'juj and ma'juj. Now the question here is, that let me in one hadith it is being said that the wall will be remade and remade and remade until one day they all come out to all of humanity but this hadith is saying the Prophet said, today a hole has been made. Now, if the hole was being made every day, then there's no need to say, today the hole has been made. Because that's happening every day. But the reason the Prophet says, today a hole has been made, is because that hole is going to get bigger. And the warning is not to the whole Muslims or all of mankind, but the warning is specifically to the Arabs. But about the Muslims, and I'll show you the hadith, I'll, I'll bring it out, inshallah, in just a, a little bit, just to show. So what is the point here? The point here is, how come one hadith is saying the wall will be made over and over again until they say, inshallah, and they'll pass the wall. And another hadith is saying, no. And that's the hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, which says now there's a hole and it's not going to come back. But at the same time, they have not been, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, have not been released to the world yet. They're yet to be released. So you see the contradiction? So now, about this second hadith, I wanted to mention one of the great scholars, okay, Shah Anwar, Anwar Shah Kashmiri, rahmatullahi He was known as the Bahaqi of, like Bahaqi is the last of the great, great muhaddisin. And he was known as the Bahaqi of Hind, you know, the Bahaqi, the great muhaddis, of the, of the land of Hind. He says, because there are he says in his commentary, which is in the Urdu language, he says that in the second hadith, the one that is in Tirmazin ibn Majah, it has a weakness 
That is that Abu Hurair radiallahu an was not saying the Prophet said this. But rather than Ka'ab, one of the companions of the Prophet said this. And so that is an athar. It is a narration of a companion of the Prophet. And the first one is directly from the wives of the Prophet sallallahu Actually, the words of the Prophet sallallahu So now, if you had to either now a muhaddis has to do one of the two things. Either he has to reconcile both narrations that they are congruent, right? Or he has to choose one over the other. So now, is there a possibility of bringing these two together? Maybe, okay? I'll give you an example in, in fiqh. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever touched his private part, lost his wudu. Another narration says, that a companion touched his private part and the Prophet said, it's just a part of your body. So some of the muhaddisin brought the narrations together. Some of the Maliki scholars, they brought the two narrations together and said, if there's clothes, then it's fine. If there's no clothes, then it breaks your wudu. Whereas Imam Hanifa and Imam Shafi choose sides between the two. Okay, in the Hanafi fiqh, if you touch your private part, your wudu is gone. In the Shafi fiqh, if you, don't, if you touch your private part, the, the wudu stays there. So what do we do with these two narrations? We have to either bring them together or we have to choose between them. So in one, it is saying the wall will be remade and remade and remade and according to the title given by the great muhaddis Imam here, Ibn Majah, he says, this is the coming out, according to his understanding, of the Khuruj of Ya'juj and Ma'juj at the time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And the other hadith is telling us that the hole has already been made and it's only going to get worse, especially for the Arabs. And that hadith is saying it's going to be difficult for all of humanity. Yes, thank you for the details, brother. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Anyway, so now let's look at some other narrations of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to this issue, okay? So either you have to combine the hadith or you have to choose the hadith. But if you were to choose the hadith, then what you have to do is you have to obviously choose the stronger hadith, the one that is muttafaqun alayhi, and the one in which there is no doubt, and in which there is no doubt it's coming directly from the Prophet, whereas in the second hadith, it's, there's shubha, according to many of the scholars, that if it's coming from the Prophet wasallam directly or not, or if this was an interpretation that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh gave, and then the Prophet took, uh, the people took it as Abu Hurairah was saying the Prophet said, this okay now let us go to the next part let me sh share with you another narration which also will spell, uh, you know, and in fact, over here, what I want to do, uh, I want to give you an example. Let me show you a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and then show you what happens sometimes. Okay. This is an, so the principle number one is if there's a contradiction, you'll either re reconcile between them or you have to choose between them. So this is principle number one that I wanted to discuss. Second, I want to show you this hadith. Okay, as an example, okay, as an example. Now, this is a narration. I'm just going to read it in English. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'll just mention the narration for now. The narration is there. And that is that people thought about Musa alayhi salatu wasalam 
that maybe, you know, he wears a lot of clothes, he puts a lot of covering on because maybe his leprosy, or maybe, you know, there's some deficiency with his body. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he was taking a shower one day, and on a stone, he had clothes. And then, you know, when he was trying to get his clothes, a stone started to move until people saw him and said, wow, you know, he's a very handsome man. You probably mentioned, you were probably read this narration. Point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salatu wasalam several times in the Quran, وَضْرِبْ عَصَاكَ hajar. Hit your staff on the stone. So some scholars said, well, that stone must be that stone, meaning that special stone that started to move. So you brought a hadith with the Quran that it may necessarily or may not necessarily fit together. So if there are two different hadiths talking about a wall, two apparently two different types of wall, you have to now decide which of those hadiths fit with the wall of Quran. So now, is this hadith closer to discussing the wall that is mentioned in the Quran about Zulqarnain? Or is the other hadith closer to the wall that is being discussed about Zulqarnain? So that is a decision somebody has to make. Because if you take the first wall, then you come to a different conclusion. And if you take the second wall, the second hadith that I showed you from Bukhari and Muslim, and you see which of those two walls fits better with the wall being mentioned in Sutul Kahf, well, if there's a wall of iron and copper, right? That's what Quran says, right? Atuni zubur al hadith, bring me the steel walls, and ufrugu alayhi qitra, and put copper upon it. Now, which of the two hadiths? fit better with Quran. So I think all of us that are here would definitely reach the conclusion that the wall that is being made and then goes back to its original shape and then goes back to its original shape and goes back to its original shape and goes back to its original shape, to its original shape cannot be the wall, especially if there is an option within Hadith literature of another wall in which there is a hole, the Prophet said, today a hole has been made, and it's not going to go back, but they haven't been released yet. So there is a second wall that seems like a solid wall. It doesn't go back to its original state. So which of the two ahadiths fit better with the description of the Quranic description of that wall? What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to teach you the methodology, how you think, how you think Islamically and how you connect and how you use Quran as a filter to understand which of these is the Quran actually. What is the Quran trying to say? And the variation within the Hadith literature, how do you filter out of what is actually, as the other Hadith might be true also. The other Hadith may have Validity. The other hadith, the first one that I mentioned, will have validity, but it doesn't necessarily have validity in relationship to its connection to the Quran. The Quranic description is of a solid structure, and the second hadith I mentioned is a description of a solid structure. The first hadith is not a solid structure. So now this becomes important because we have to be aware of this when people are talking. So now let me mention another uh, point uh, regarding this whole issue. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Okay, I'm just going to read the English just to keep it simple. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
Allah will, on the day of resurrection, Allah will say to Adam, so this is the first confusion about Ya'juj and Ma'juj is the wall. So I talked about that a little bit. The second confusion that generally happens is this one. And I'm going to then try to explain this one also. Okay. O Adam, Adam will reply, O Allah, I'm here. And all good is in your hands. Allah will say, bring out the people of the fire. And Adam will say, oh Allah, how many are there the people of the fire? Allah will reply, from every 1,000, take out 999. At that time, children will become very hoary-headed. Every pregnant female will have a miscarriage. And one will see mankind as drunken. And yet they will not be drunken, but dreadful. And will be, uh, will be the wrath of Allah. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ asked, oh Allah's apostle, who is that one? The, he said, the Prophet ﷺ, rejoice with good, glad tidings. One person will be from you and 1,000 will be from Gog, Magog. So the Prophet said, ﷺ, by him in whose hands is my life, I hope that you will be one-fourth of the people of paradise. We shouted Allahu Akbar and added, I hope that you will be one-third of the people of paradise paradise. We shouted Allahu Akbar. And he said, I hope that you will be half of the people of paradise. We shouted Allahu Akbar. Further, he further said, you Muslims compared to non-Muslims are like a black hair in the skin of a white ox or a white hair in the skin of a black ox is a very small, is, is very small compared to uh, the non-Muslims. Now, so this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ seems to suggest that there are going to be so many people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and so little Muslims. Yet we have a, another hadith, which I'm going to just mention it. The Prophet said, ﷺ, because it's a very famous hadith, remember? Where the Prophet said that you will have wahan, you'll have love of dunya, and you'll leave jihad. And the Prophet says, Bal antum kathir, you will be so many Muslims, you will be so many. I'm going to come to that. But one thing that is clear also in this hadith, by the way, is that Ya'juj and Ma'juj, as Abdullah bin uh, in Fatul Bari, Imam Hajar has also quoted this, and I will show you the other narrations regarding this, that what Ya'juj and Ma'juj are what? Human beings. Why are they human beings? They're human beings because they have judgment. They're human beings because they will be judged for heaven and hell. Okay? They're not necessarily jinn. Okay? They're not angels. So they're human beings. The other narrations that and it's so interesting because then when people mention the other narrations that are very, very weak about they have big ears, they sleep with one ear and the other ear, they cover themselves. They'll say, we won't take those metaphorical. We will take those literal. And the other ahadith that it fits better if you actually switch it around. Okay. And so uh, now let me show you some of the other narrations. So this subject becomes more clear, inshallah. We can go over this also. The Prophet says, yeah, Juj and Majuj are from the children of Adam, and no one will die until thousand are born unto them. There's another narration. The Prophet says, yeah, Juj is from the children of Adam, and Majuj are from the children of Adam. And when the Prophet ﷺ described them, how did he describe them? Do you remember? The narration, I'll show it to you in a little bit. They will have small eyes. They will have red hair. They will have flat faces. Anybody remember this narration? Probably. So these are human beings. What is, why is that important? Because if they are human beings and you're building a wall for human beings, then it has to be a wall that generally is built for all human beings. Meaning 
If they're non-human beings, you can say, okay, this wall is a special wall. It doesn't have to be like a wall of a human being. But Zulqarnain is building a wall of steel and copper. And another thing I want to share with you very quickly, inshallah, two things that I'll share with you that could be helpful in understanding, again, uh, I'm not interested in necessarily promoting one opinion or the other. I'm more interested in in coming to an understanding with everyone about methodology. What is the methodology to understand something? How do you analyze something? So I'm hoping by doing this analysis, it will help you sharpen and give you tools to help you analyze texts uh, when you read them yourself. So for example, let me share with you about uh, this, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, yes, alunaka and dhul qarnain. O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they ask you about dhul qarnain. Kul sa'atlu alaykum minhu dhikra. Let me give you some report or some information about him, some mention of him, some dhikr of him. Inna makkannahu fil ard. We established him on earth. Now, can someone tell me if it said, inna makkanna lahu fi ardi? What does that mean? And inna makkannahu fi al ardi. What's the difference? Can somebody tell me? If there was no alif lam on the word earth, what would it mean? And if it has an alif lam on the word earth, what does it mean? How are they different? Let me share with you another two examples from Quran. So you're absolutely, because these things are small, very basic things, but they have a huge difference in the meaning. Okay, let me share with you uh, one example. Actually, I'm going to teach this tomorrow in my Yasin class, go over the significance of this very point. Over here it says, ala sirat Mustaqim. Is there any alif lam? There's no alif lam. You are indeed from the messengers. Inna kala min al mursalin upon. There's no as sirat al mustaqim. How does that change the translation from, let's say, Surah Al Fatiha, where it says, "Ihdinas as sirat al mustaqim." Guide us to that path that which we know is the straight path. Because alif lam means da, it is known, it is understood, right? Guide us to that path that we know as the straight path, that which you have given us the knowledge and information of the straight path. Help us to walk that path. Put our knowledge into practice. Versus in Surah Yasin, it's talking about to warn a people whose people, whose forefathers were not warned and they didn't know. So they don't know. The, they just know the Prophet's committed to this path. He's not joking. But they don't know the details of that path. So there's no as-sirat al-mustaqim. Okay? In the same way, when it says, inna makkanna lahu fil ard, we established him on the earth, versus if it would have said, inna makkanna lahu fi ard, without the alif lam, what would be the difference? Al-Ard means you know that land. The people asking the question know that land. And the Prophet has heard of this land. This is not an unknown land in some unknown place, maybe out there in space or wherever. It's not. It is a known land. To both the questioner and the responder, this is a land that was known to them at that time. Meaning the world, as much as it was to the extent of human discovery of that time, it's part of that world. So if Ya'juj and Ma'juj, then what does it say about Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Again, when it talks about the sun, it says Ashams. Doesn't say Kawakib, doesn't say Najam, it doesn't say Shams, it says Ashams, meaning the sun. Meaning when you say the sun, it has to be the sun that you know, not a sun you don't know about. And then,
Let me show you now. Inna ya'juj wa ma'juj mufsiduna fi al-ardu. Ya'juj and ma'juj, they're causing corruption in the earth. Which earth? The one that you already know. The one you are already, what? Familiar with. And also, the word mufsidun or fasada yafsidu is used for who? For human beings. Used for human beings. So, fasad is not caused by animals. Fasad is caused by are you going to place on earth the one that will cause fasad? Fasad has appeared in land and sea. Because of what man's hands have earned, the human, mankind's hands have earned. Fasad is done by human beings. If one animal kills another animal, that's not called fasad. But if a human being kills another innocent human being, that's fasad. They said, oh, they are causing corruption in the world. Now, what is my point here? Is that that wall between the two hadiths, which one fits better with Quran? Number one. Number two, where is this? If it is taking... If it is the wall that is a physical wall, then what? Then it is referring to human interaction because why? It is in the earth versus a earth. And it is a facade versus some other word. And they are causing facade where? In the earth. Okay. Now, let me go over some other uh, basic ideas, inshallah, and then we'll call it a day. Um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Uh, over here, uh, that this was just a uh, Anwar Shah Kashmir rahmatullah was just referring to him this was about that let me just uh, quickly go through some of the other stuff I have here uh, this again is something that I already mentioned okay here I'll mention this uh, maybe some other time I'll go into the other narrations but this is uh, okay for now inshallah ta'ala there was a discovery uh, of the wall of Dhul Qarnayn in this place that, that was described at the Prophet Sallallahu time in the Prophet said, yes, that is the wall of Dhul Qarnayn. Uh, and also at the time of Umar bin Khattab, it was discovered. And then they also found the body of the Niyala and they translated his uh, book, the book of Daniel from uh, the language it is into Arabic because it has significance, some level of significance. And then Umar radiallahu and told them to dig uh, 12 graves and put him into one of, the, one of the 12 secretly so no one will know where he's buried. Um, and then uh, later on in the Abbasid Empire, uh, there was uh, a, a, a Khalifa had a dream about the wall of Zulqarnain being surpassed. And so he sent an expedition and they spent time over there. So these things are there. Inshallah, I'll talk about those things at another time. But today, I only wanted to make one point very clear. That not all ahadiths that are discussing a subject necessarily are discussing that subject. We have to look at them and see which one is closer to Quran. And to in order to determine, okay, if this is discussing a wall and this is discussing a wall, then are both of these connecting to the same wall? or one of them is connecting to the same wall. And so this will help you organize your thoughts. And so inshallah, I think uh, I did that. And also it's very clear in many of the hadiths about the one, the hadith that says they'll go to paradise, they'll, you know, oh, I didn't answer the question about why will so many people be part of the Ajaj and Matraj? First of all, that hadith as the hadith in the first one, 
Okay. Sometimes you read a hadith, and if you have to think a little bit about, is this really the case? Meaning, uh, is it really the case that so many people are going to go to hellfire and then so many people are going to go to Jannah? Is that, does that contradict other hadiths? Okay, this is my question. Uh, so many people are part of the Muslim world, right? So many people are part of the Muslim world. And then Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be so many that will be like one strand of hair in a, like compared to a sheep, maybe at some point in history, that's possible, but it's not because why? The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa you'll be many. Muslims will be many. That's a saying hadith. So you have to... So you have to be able to say, okay, what this hadith is saying, is it in fact true? Yani, is it true, literally true? Because if it's a true hadith, it cannot contradict actual events. Right? Could it mean that so many Muslims will be accepting of the system of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and they're all destined for hellfire. Even that's very problematic, because how many Muslims actually know that they have to make such a choice even? So when something doesn't make sense, like there's a wall and it comes back, and it's a wall and it's come back, unless you're accepting it as a miracle. But if you have two and you have to choose, and one makes sense and the other doesn't make sense, it's easier to come to better conclusions if you start with the one that makes more sense. If you take this hadith that there'll be 1,000 Ya'juj and Ma'juj to one Muslim going to paradise, it's on the one side good because it's horrifying and that's we need that, right? We need that horror or that shock, you can say. But from an academic point of view, from the point of view of reality, Right, the prophet is also saying what that the same hadith that's saying that there will be one hair to an entire sheep or an entire cow is saying that you will be one third of Jannah, one fourth of Jannah, one fourth of Jannah, one third of Jannah, and two thirds of Jannah. How can you be two thirds of Jannah if you're only one little hair compared to the whole? So the hadith is self contradicting itself. So let me show you that hadith again so that you're with me on this. Oh, maybe... Um... Okay. So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah will on the day of resurrection say to Adam, Adam, and Allah, Adam will say, Yes, my master, all good is in your hands. Allah will say, Bring out these people of fire. Oh, Allah, how many of these are the people of fire? Allah will reply, from every 1,000, take out 999. At that time, the children will become very hoary and headed. By the way, this ayah is actually talking about, and Sutul Hajj is talking about at the moment. And I can show you the ayah, just so that you're clear, so you're able to identify weaknesses, at least in the text, if not in the asnad. If you can identify weaknesses within the text itself, that if this ayah is not talking about that, then why is it saying it's talking about this is on the day of judgment, it's saying. Anyway, for 1,000, take out 999. At that time, the children will become hoary-headed. Hor hor Every pregnant female will have a miscarriage, and one will see mankind as drunken, yet they will not be drunken, but dreadful will be the wrath of Allah. The companions of the Prophet asked, O oh Allah, O oh Allah's Messenger, who is that accepted one? He said, rejoice with gladdings. One person from you and 1,000 will be from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And the Prophet says, by him in whose hand is my life, I hope that there will be one-fourth of the people uh, that you, meaning Muslims, will be one-fourth of the people of paradise. We shouted, Allahu Akbar. I hope that you will be one-third of the people of paradise. We shouted, Allahu Akbar. He said, I hope you're half of the people of paradise. We shouted, Allahu Akbar. He said, you Muslims are com compared to the 
non-Muslims is like a black hair on the skin of a white ox or, a, or like a white hair on the skin of a black ox. You see the inherent contradiction there because how are we going to be because in order to be half of paradise, one third of paradise, we have to be at least half the ox. So the hadith that's really confused people because people, first of all, a lot of people feel that they don't look like human beings, even though many hadiths confirm that they're from human beings. And the second big confusion, so the first confusion is that wall being made over and over again that throws people off. And then is some of their description of how they look. And the third is that there'll be so many compared to the Muslims. And so the result is maybe this is something foreign to our world. This is maybe foreign to human beings. This is maybe foreign to, uh, you know, just being human beings. So then we come up with some analysis that maybe they'll come from inside the earth, from the North Pole. They'll be like different human beings. That there is a possibility that something like some sort of phenomenon will happen like that towards the end but one thing should be clear that they're definitely part of bunny adam and that a normal steel wall of copper could prevent them from going through so it's it's not like uh you know there'll be some monsters that are going to be eating up human beings left right and center because uh then that wouldn't be called facade it would be some other word would be musiba or darar or some other word, zunzilu uh, hatta, you know, uh, some other word. But fasad is specifically the opposite of salaha yaslahu islah, salihat, good deeds. Okay, so if they are, then the hadith is also making it clear at the same time that they're responsible on the day of judgment. They're going to stand before Allah on the day of judgment. So, I hope this uh, answers some of your questions in terms of methodology. That look, always look at a hadith. And say, okay, does the text make, because you don't have the knowledge of these sanad, right? So if you don't know how to use asma rijal, and so that's okay, but read the text and then say, okay, are there, this is a very important question, are there other traditions of the Prophet that say the opposite to this? Because unless you ask that to yourself, if you look at only one hadith and make a judgment on that one hadith, you're never going to be really guided, ever. Ever, ever, you always have to take a hadith and then bring together all the other hadiths in the similar subject, and then you'll see the internal contradictions, and then you'll be in a better judgment to see what fits Quran, what doesn't fit Quran, and what do I have to actually take from this. So both the number of people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and if the word thousand is used in the metaphorical sense, that can mean that because the prophet says majority of the people in the end of times will be Roman. So the Roman, the, the, the European Jews will be part of that, right? And the prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember the first, uh, the second hadith which says, Woe unto the Arabs. Because why? The prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let me show you the hadith. The prophet clearly said that there will be few Arabs. Arabs are going to be in great danger of because of the wars. And so let me uh, show that to you, inshallah, here very quickly. Uh, let me see if it comes up. You will be here. Okay. Anyway, there, I mentioned this hadith in one of my other lectures recently. So the attack of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, of these uh, people that will cross this wall, is that their attack will be specifically on the Arab world. 
And so you then therefore find, for example, many narrations that are talking about Dajjal being where? In the Arab world specifically. He will try to go to Mecca. He will try to go to Medina. He will take over all of Arab lands except for the until until the, the place behind the mountain of Uhud where he won't be allowed to come into Medina, so on and so forth. Uh, can Chinese people be also? Well, inshallah, when I discuss their description, uh, then I will discuss that, inshallah. And uh, there is a video I did with a brother who studied the subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj for almost 15 years. Maybe some of you watched that. And that he also goes into details about that. Uh, I think somebody just sent me the hadith. So let me see if I can. Let me see. So, O oh Messenger of Allah, what, where will the Arabs be that day? He said, on that day, there will be few, few Arabs. So, majority of the Arabs would have been killed during the Malhama. Okay. And so, this is part of what will be uh, happening. Oh, I, will, I didn't show it to you guys. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me just uh, go back and show you guys. This is the hadith. Hold on one second. Uh, hold on. O oh, Messenger of Allah, where will the Arabs be that day? He said, on that day, they will be few. And most of them will be in Jerusalem. And their leader will be a righteous man. So on and so forth. So, yeah, Juj and Ma'juj, another thing is, if they're, it has, if they are, yeah, Juj and Ma'juj, is it, they're against humanity or are they against specifically the Arabs and then the Muslims? If there are aliens, for example, are aliens going to come to earth to go against humanity? Or they're going to come to earth to go against just only the Arabs, they specifically chose them, you know. So um, this is some points about how to look at the narrations and hadith and why we should always dig deeper about why, what are other narrations of the Prophet saying and if it makes sense, okay. And the filter is ultimately the Quran, right? So, okay. So if there's any questions, I'll answer two, three questions and we can talk. Yeah. Regarding you're saying about the filter for the, um, for the Quran and the Hadith, but does that apply as well with the Quran itself? Because in the Quran, there's a few places where it mentions specifically a wall. Or Quran has made a wall very specific. I think it's Hadith and Baqarah and Surah Kaf. Is Does that apply the same way that you tried to make a put them together and try to make something or is that the wrong methodology for that place so yeah exactly so so Kahf mentions the wall which of which wall in the hadith literature fits better with the wall mentioned in Kahf? so you first take the one that fits better right now you got this other hadith and if you still feel it's authentic if you feel it's authentic now you have to decide okay this hadith fits the one in quran this hadith doesn't seem to fit because we don't know for sure, doesn't seem to fit the Quran. Therefore, what am I going to do? Either A, I can give it a metaphorical interpretation, which is necessary when you're talking about the end of times because the prophet's sitting so far away. Or B, is this hadith to be uh, taken as just information and not accepted, meaning idhani? Because it's not the Prophet saying this, like in this case, it's a Sahabi saying this. So that was his feeling of what would happen with Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And so therefore, you can try to bring it together, or you have to choose the more authentic one. You choose which of the two paths you prefer.
So, Sheikh, with reference to Quran, where it says that bin kulli hadha bin yansilun. So, uh, I remember once you were interpreting it as like something related to satellite or stuff like that. And, and in, in your last video, you were uh, interpreting it as more of like a Jews coming from northern part of the world to back to Jerusalem. So, so I would like just your views on that. Yeah. So, min kulli hadab yan silun. Hadab literally means something elevated and coming down. Okay. Now, what's interesting is, of course, the Quran is like the Prophet says, right? Jawami uh, kalam. You say many things in one thing. Right. And so the, it is possible that there is more than one correct uh, explanation or multiple correct uh, multiple explanations coming from the same ayah or same group of ayah as long as what you're true to the Arabic language, because what Quran and Arabian. So the first thing that explains the Quran is the Arabic language. That's the first key. And your explanation it would be in multiple levels, but it cannot contradict any of the other parts of Quran. So let's take, for example, this ayah that you just mentioned, right? Now, futihat means to open, literally, like fatiha. Futihat means to conquer. Right? Something is open for them, or they are given victory. From where? Hatta ida futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj min from kullu from every hadab. Every kullu could refer to a genesis, meaning every type of elevation. So, for example, just go with me on this. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Rum, if you remember, He mentions what about the Roman Empire? Zahra al fasadu fil barri wal bahr. They did fasad in, in ocean and in land. So the British Empire conquered the land. The United States conquered the seas. The next, what's remaining? The next big civilization, the next big challenge will be a civilization that conquers the air. That will be their power. They will have air power. And you know, the, the Israeli military is in the forefront of air power. And if anybody studied what happened in the Six Day War, how did they win? Does anybody remember? What was the main reason that they won? The airplanes came and bombed all the Egyptian planes on that were already in the ground. So ever since then, they've been, they, they have made it their big thing. So hadab min hadab yansilun. Now yansilun is a very interesting word because it also means nasl, progeny, descendants, one after the other. So they will bring down their descendants from every elevation back to Jerusalem. Look at what happened from Russia to uh, Jerusalem with the Jews, the European Jews. And then now is going to happen with the Ukrainian Jews from the north, bringing them down to Jerusalem. And then before that, it happened between Germany and France and other northern places, bringing down their descendants. So whether it is geographically, whether it is in technology, whether it is by airplane, because how did they go to, how did all the Jews go to Israel? They went on boats? They walked there. They all went on planes. In fact, I'm going to be doing a, a, a video on this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Haramun ala qariyatin. It is haram upon the city, meaning Jerusalem. They can't go back to Jerusalem until what? Until they can't go back to Jerusalem until hatta idha futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj. Until ya'juj and ma'juj are released and they come from every elevation. And so the Jews have been coming from every elevation, right? From Germany, planes coming and landing, from Europe, from Russia, from America. Now even American Jews are leaving. I'll be doing the video on that. But the meaning of it, the literal meaning, kullu hadab. Hadab also is used for kite, something up, okay? But it, it has a connection with coming down. Okay. And they'll descend. And this may also be there in, in the end times, their military tactic, that they'll take control of all the high spots to attack the people. Even right now, when the settlements they're doing in the West Bank, they're taking the high spots, the mountainous areas. And the people living in Gaza Strip, they're the ones on the bottom. 
Okay, so this uh, verse is uh, very deep in its meaning. Uh, everything from uh, moving from the north to towards the south in Jerusalem to the type of technology they'll be using and how they'll be able to attain their victories, what will be the key to that will be until they're given victories. And Allah is telling us what will be their secret, their strategy will be that they'll be uh, using the elevation as their, um, as their tactic. I hope that inshallah helps you understand. So that will be, that includes technology, that includes uh, military strategy, that includes their physical coming down to Jerusalem, so on and so forth. Sheikh, I had a, a quick question. So what would you say to those who say um, that who refer to the hadith um, that they'll come out uh, after Nabi Isa comes? So they're looking at that hadith. Uh, is there any, how do we know the set of events? It's clear like to me that this is, is not linear. It could be happening. Um, it, it, they could be, they could be, there during Isa's time and also before. So how do you answer that? Yeah, it's very simple. Number one, they, if they're human beings, right? And they had a normal wall of a normal human being, then that means that they were there at the time of Zulqarnain, right? Did they just disappear after the wall was built? By, by the way, over about that, I'll share something with you. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Look, many walls were built in history. Uh, to, or I'll just tell you, I won't, I won't show it right now. Many walls were built in history to prevent specifically a certain group of people from crossing over. The wall of Gorgon, which is also by the Caspian Sea. Uh, let me see if I can quickly show that to you. Uh, let me just. Uh, just bring it out. I'll show you. So this is the wall of Gorgon, for example. Okay. This was also built in the same area, basically. Okay. This is the Caspian Sea. So in the olden days, it is well known that what? No one's going to climb. I'll give you an example. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we love the mountain, mountain of Uhud and Uhud loves us. Why? Because it's a natural feature that prevents enemies from coming. And so when the Battle of Ahzab was happening, they had to build a trench up to the Battle of Uhud from Medina and up to on both sides, right? So the rest of it, the mountains taken care of. So when you look at the world, on the northern side, you had the tribes, the European tribes. On this side, where Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan is, this is all desert. No one's going to bring an army through the desert and the mountains, through the mountains and the deserts, right? The, the Hindu Kush mountains and also and so forth. No one's going to bring a mountain around from there into uh, this area of Iraq and Baghdad and Israel where the Jews were and so on and so forth. So you have the wall of China. You have the wall of Gorgon. You have the Darbant uh, wall, which is most likely this wall that we're talking about. But they're all, uh, the wall of Gorgon and the wall of uh, Darbant are like, just two parts you can say there's the caspian sea and then on this side is the wall of gorgon and this side is the darbant wall on a little bit higher and then the chinese wall all to prevent the same group of people from passing through historically that's a fact okay that uh the wall of china was basically made to keep these northern tribes away and uh, the wall of gorgon also to stop them from going through into what was at that time the Persian Empire, 
and then the same thing with the Darbant wall. Uh, that was to cause all these walls were built for the same reason, for to prevent the same group of people. So the point being to your question is that they were there at that time. And the wall stopped them because in those days they had they didn't have planes, right? So in those days they weren't able to pass it. And then we have, uh, like I said, the interview with the brother, Brother Abdul Rahman, who did a great interview on this topic. When should, everyone should watch that. But the day the Prophet said the hole has been built, if you go back in Hijri to that year, and because we know the year the Prophet said this, and you go back to the events of the world, the historical events of the world, it's, it's a known time where the Scythian, uh, the certain tribes had begun to break these walls of, of, of uh, especially the, 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 the wall of Darbant and had started to invade into areas that people were trying to prevent them from invading. So anyway, so yes, so there, things may go in different phases, right? So there may be one coming out of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and then another phase where there's another level of them coming out, a third level. I'll give you an example. Ya'juj and Ma'juj come out and they take control of Jerusalem, one level. But they're so high in technology that they can produce babies or produce anything. Nowadays, uh, playing with the genes is like, you know, like we do with trees, take this apple tree and take this other apple tree and create a third apple tree. They can create any type of human, literally, right? So it may be these kind of like uh, IT and this technology can take things to a new phase in terms of genetics. So it's very possible that things will take new colors and shapes. But there, if you are true to the Quran, in the world that we live in, if we're looking at where is this phenomenon happening, that people have returned back to Jerusalem and they came from an elevated area, then that is only pointing to one group of people. So yes, things can happen in phases. Also, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which is very important, by the way, about Lake Tiberias. And I'm sure you all know this, that the Prophet said, the last of them will say, when the first of us were here, Lake Tiberias was full. And so when the last of them come, the first of them will say, and so uh, Lake Tiberias has been going down. Then in 19, uh, 19, uh, 2019, 20, uh, 20, 19, 2018, the, thing, the Lake Tiberias actually went up. Then this year, again, it's way down again, way, way down. I'm going to actually do a video on this. But the Prophet said that when the, uh, when the last of them come, we'll say, when we were here, this was full. And today, Lake Tiberias is not full. What does it mean? It means that, that as Jews come to Lake Tiberias, overall, the flow of water will decline. And all the scientists are worried because they don't understand why water is declining in Israel. In fact, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a special video, so I'll show you in, in things in detail at that point, inshallah. Hello, Mr. Sheikh, uh, one last point with reference to the last question. Uh, I remember uh, Sheikh Imran was also, w when trying to address that, that, that query, he mentioned that the confusion is the, is the, is the usage of the word there. I mean, uh, the hadith refers that after Isa uh, Salam, Yajud and Majud will be sent, not released. I mean, he mentioned that the word Arabic word is Baasa. Baasa, so, the same one. Yes, exactly. Yes, so, so that that's an indication. That word in it, in and of itself is an indication that they are not going to be released at that point in time. They will. It's not the Khuruj. Yeah, right? it's not the Baasa. Yes. Yes. Makes sense. Sheikh, and last last question from me, uh, because I'm in discussions with with some other sisters who do not believe me. But uh, why didn't the earlier scholars recognize the creation of Israel as this is Yajuj and Ma'ajuj? No, all of the commentators of Quran, not all, but many of the commentators of the Quran, that when they looked at the ayans to Bani Israel, they knew that the Jews will be there, and Isa Salam will come, and all the Jews will be destroyed because the sunnah of Allah is, I mean, many of the great scholars, you know, from Mona Farahi 
all the way back to uh, some of the uh, classical scholars. It, the sunnah of Allah is, Allah does not destroy a people except in front of the Prophet. And if, like, I'll give you an example. Which Prophet of Allah left his place of duty? Yunus. The punishment was coming. He left. He said, well, they're done. I'm going to go. The punishment was stopped. Then the boat happened. He went into the whale. He come back and then he, was, he went to his... But they did Toba because when they saw the punishment coming, they did Toba. Had he stayed, they wouldn't have been able to do Toba. So now it's the Sunnah of Allah. If the punishment is coming to people of Nut or the people of Musa or the people of whoever, it has to be done as the Prophet, as a witness. I delivered the message. And now after delivering the message, this is the result. Now, what is the exception here is Isa, والسلام, just like Yunus, he says that, or, or he says, it's in the Bible, that you will be given no sign except like the sign of Jonah. The same thing will happen to me that happened to Jonah, meaning there with some distinctions. But Isa والسلام, was sent, Allah says in the Quran, La aghlibanna ana wa rusuli. me and my messenger, we have to prevail. And so Isa was sent, they tried to kill him, Allah raised him. But when you tried to kill a messenger of Allah, not Nabi, a Rasul, when you tried to kill a Rasul, that cannot go without consequences. And so therefore, Isa والسلام, has to come back to witness the final destruction of the people that he was sent to. Okay? And this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no difference of opinion on the fact that the prophets of Allah have to witness the destruction of the nations that they were sent to if they reject them. And so... Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So, yeah, uh, as far as uh, why didn't they uh, specifically say there will be a state of Israel? No, they didn't say that. But they said in the ayah of the Quran, we'll bring you all ming mingled in from different parts of the world to one place, meaning Israel, will bring you back. This is the consensus that all the Jews will be in Israel and Isa alayhi salatu salam will come. Otherwise, what? Isa is not going to come and some Jews are here, some in America, some in France, some in the, you know, that's, it's not how it's going to be. They're actually all going to be brought back to one place. I'm going to do a video on that too. So I'm going to definitely do a, a video on Lake Tiberias. And I'm going to also do a, lay, a video on how all the Jews are slowly going back. And this year, more Jews went back to Israel than any other year before this. So can we pinpoint like who are the Yajuj and Majuj? Are they the Jews or were they like a different home? Can you hear me, Sheikh? Yeah, no, I was reading one comment. Uh, yes, so Allah yeah. Sallallahu Muhammad. Yes, so these are basically Jews who went to Europe and European Jews who spoke a different language than Hebrew. They spoke Yiddish. These are the people that have now begun to take over the world. And uh, these are the Jews now in Israel, not the original uh, Semitic Jews, but these, uh, you can say, white Yiddish Anglo-Saxon Jews. And Ya'juj and Ma'juj probably refers to Protestant Christianity's alliance uh, with the Zionist movement. If you, and, and the types of people, the broadly speaking, the types of people in it. So um, the, the white Jews uh, have an alliance with Protestant Christians. And this is another important video because the Quran makes it very clear that there'll be two different types of Christianities. I'll give you an example. The Quran says in one place, uh, uh, The Jews say the Christians have nothing. And the, the Nasara, the Christians say the Jews have nothing. Allah says, even though they're reading the same book, the same Genesis, the same Deuteronomy, the same numbers, the same, they're reading the same Torah, but they differ. They say he's not going to Jannah, he's saying he's not going to Jannah. Christians are saying the Jews won't go, the Jews saying the Christians won't go. On the other side, the same Quran says, Be Jew or Christian, you'll be guided. 
This is what's happening in the world right now, is there's an alliance and a friendship in this Judeo-Christian civilization where the Judeo-Christian civilization has become like one and the Jews love the Christians and the Christians love the Jews. And this is, diff this is what Sheikh Imran Hussein calls the Santa Claus Christianity. But this is a different type of Christianity than the original Christianity of the Orthodox Christians who Allah says you will find that they will say, that we're Christians. And Allah says, you'll find them being on your side more than these other uh, Christians because they've given up their alliance uh, or they've already declared their alliance in a sense in, in one direction or the other. Over here, I'll mention something what a political scientist said that is of somewhat importance. And that is that, look, from every perspective, the Western civilization should have sided with the Muslims over the Jews. Why? Where's the oil? Where is, who has a larger tract of land? Who has a larger population? So the Arabs were, or the Muslims in the Arab world, on the one side, they have larger land, they have more resources in their areas. But despite all that, and neglecting all of that, they chose to make an alliance of Israel over all of the Muslims and the rest of the world. I'll take one last question. Sure, can I just ask another question? Going back to what I was asking earlier about the, the, the subject matter of the wall in different parts of the Quran. Is it, um, are we allowed to see, um, to analyze them? There's three different parts that like we said before was in Kaf and Hadid and Bakara, I think. Surah al Bakara. Are we allowed to take each one of them and look at them? Although we don't have knowledge to make Kaf, but is there a link between those two? Because I last mentioned the wall in the Quran. The, the wall of Zulkarnain is only mentioned in one part of the Quran, which is. No, no, I mean, I mean, with just specifically the word "the wall," because the last one. Oh, I okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting point. So, yes. do, Thank you for bringing that up. Something because it's why, why the word "wall" and the story, and then why the word "wall" and the story, and etc. So, so then you have to further then analyze this. Let's see if I can. Here, let me. Do that. This is a very this is actually a very good question. I like this question a lot. And let me explain. There are different words in the Quran used for walls. One of them is jidar, for example. And Allah says about Jews, referring to the battle of Hunain. They will not fight you except behind walls. So like, for example, they've built a wall around the Palestinians. They will not fight you except behind this wall. Right? So this is part of their strategy that's been discussed in the Quran. Then the uh, wall of Zulkarnain is not called Jidar, which is the normal word for a wall is Jidar. Uh, they say, make us a Sudda, and he makes them a Rudma. This is in Sutul Kahf. He, 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 they asked for a barrier, and he made like a strong barrier. Okay. So what you would have to do is, you would have to look at the Quran and see what are the different words used for the word wall. Okay. Once you've determined that, then that will then give you a link to, okay, there's different types of walls in Quran. Ah, okay, okay. So what is this wall for? And what is this wall for? And what is this wall for? The Quran also talks about walls at a spiritual level. We put a barrier before them and a barrier behind them. It's also there. So you look at the word wall, but then when you look at the word wall, it'll give you different Arabic words for the same phenomenon called a wall. But then after you look at the word wall and the different words, whether it is sudda or whether it is jidar or whether it is the word surah, the word surah like surah al-anbiya, the word surah means a wall itself, like a fortified wall. Every surah is like a fortified wall. The word surah is used in the Quran for the day of judgment when the a wall comes down and those that are outside the wall didn't make it and those that come inside the wall are in the mercy of Allah like like this 
So yes, this is a good methodology. You look at the word wall, you look at the different words used for the wall, and then try to make sense of them that why is this particular word meaning this, and why is this particular meaning used for this, and why is this particular word used for this. In fact, uh, there is a book, let's see if I have it handy with me right now. Uh, there is a book in which one great scholar, uh, he put all the synonymous words of Quran together. Like for zoj means spouse, but imra'a also means spouse. So when does Allah use the word imra and when does Allah use the word zoj? So he, then he goes into that. And he did this with every single word of the Quran, every single word. And so that's a great resource that I use sometimes. And when we're discussing the issue of walls, sure, that would be a methodology somebody could use. Say, okay, Quran uses three words for the word wall. And the word used for the wall of the main is neat because of such an idea. Yeah, is, there, is that uh, Let me see if I can show it to you. Uh, I don't see it right now exactly, but I do have it. And it's actually one of the books I like to use quite a lot. Okay, I can't find it right now, but I do have it. And it's a very great book, actually. It's called Mutaradiful Quran. Mutaradiful Quran is the name of the book. Uh, actually, I'm surprised I can't see it right now uh, because I usually have it with me, uh, just near me, because I use it a lot. Mm -hmm. It's called Mutarad, Mutaradifatul Quran. And it takes all the synonymous words. Like if you were to look up the wall, word wall, you would find it and all the different words used in Quran for the word wall. Um, maybe it's in my book. Here. Yeah, I just found it. It's this book. And every student of Quran should have this, but there's only one problem. It's in Urdu. Okay, so for example, for those of us that understand, so like if you're looking at this book, you'll see it says uh, in, in Urdu, it'll say, had se kam karna. Then it'll give you the words for that which in English means reducing something below its level, okay? And then the words for that and its different meanings. And so he, he took every synonymous word and showed how it, because the Quran is not a waste of words, right? Like when we're writing something, I don't want to be boring, so I don't want to use the same word over and over again. Maybe I'll use Islam one time, I'll use Iman the next time, I'll use another word next time. So it's not boring, you're not reading the same word, Quran doesn't do that. When Quran uses a different word that has a similar meaning to another word, it's using this word for one reason, it's using that word. Like the word insan is different from the word bashar, which means human being, which is different from nas, right? So when it says yayuhal nas is different from yayuhal insan, which would be different from yayuhal bashar, for example. So bashar means human beings, insan means human beings, nas means human beings, but they're used in different contexts. For example, nas is used in the social context, okay? Bashar is used in the creation context. Insan is used in his, in his, you can say, downfall or failures or flaws context, like this. 
Jack, is this somewhere online then? If because it's an order. I think so. You can probably get a PDF copy on it. I think I'm, I've heard. Will it be in Urdu or will it be in um, Arabic and English? No, this is in Urdu. This work is a genius work, but it is in Urdu. All right, guys. Inshallah, I hope this was helpful. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look into that. Uh, okay, inshallah, Asalaamu Alaikum.